Welcome everyone. I'm glad you are with us today. Um, good afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to bring today's event um, as we celebrate Hypertension Education Awareness Month. And we're kicking off our Innovations in Hypertension Control mini series. Uh, my name is Rochelle Bartnick and I am the Senior Director of Community Impact for the American Heart Association. I'm serving um, the St. Louis region and outstate Missouri. Now, over recent years, the American Heart Association and our partners in uh, the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, our Million Hearts partners and others have put a spotlight on the importance of managing hypertension through convenings and workshops and symposia. And we are ex excited to bring this workshop to you today. I'd like to invite Chris Cumberfield from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services to say uh, a few words and welcome as well. Chris. Thank you, Rochelle. A uh, few words about Hypertension Education Month. May is Hypertension Education Month and is recognized by CDC and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. The virtual workshop series is a collaboration of the American Heart Association, Health Quality Innovators, and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, three partners of the Missouri Million Hearts Partnership. Of course, there are many ways to lower blood pressure, and we will highlight three promising innovations in hypertension control. Each of the programs in the mini series establishes an emphasis on improving the quality of hypertension for patients. Thanks to all of our attendees for tuning in today. Rochelle, I turn this back to you. Great, thank you so much. And I do appreciate the collaboration um, in bringing this uh, workshop together. We do have a couple of, of tips on uh, ways to uh, make your Zoom ex experience positive. Um, on your screen now is a way to um, control your view. Um, there are some tips on uh, your viewing options. So at the top are your viewing options. You can exit the full screen and then make sure your view is set to gall gallery view um, and side-by-side -side mode. Um, you can also control uh, your speakers um, as well as use the slide bar um, to, to determine the, the viewing, viewing scale and, and preference. Um, and next, uh, we invite you to engage with us in throughout this conversation, throughout this workshop, and please use the comment box uh, or the chat box to, to provide your comments. Uh, you could set it now uh, for when we get to the Q&A section to all panelists and attendees. Um, and if you'd like to, go ahead and tell us where you're tuning, tuning in from. Um, you can make sure then, then that that chat box is set up correctly. All right, well, I am really excited to, um, to introduce our featured presenter, Dr. Annie Eisenbeis. She is a practicing pharmacist at a family-owned pharmacy in rural central Missouri and is the Director of Practice Development at the Missouri Pharmacy Association. In her current role, she is involved in strategizing, preparing, and implementing successful and sustainable programs to enhance the quality of care and improve access for all patients through innovative grant projects. Currently, she's working on pilot projects involving remote physiological monitoring of blood pressure, a pharmacist to pharmacist collaboration through shared EHR, and education and training opportunities for pharmacists in billing and sustainability of all programs. Dr. Eisenbeis serves as the Vice President of the Missouri Immunization Coalition and was appointed to the Substance Abuse Advisory Commission for the City of Columbia. I also love to be able to share unique um, um, attributes of our presenters and she has a unique talent. She is a certified Irish dance instructor and owns the only Irish dance studio in Central Missouri. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Eisenbeis. Welcome. Thank you so Thanks. much. Um, all right, I am really excited uh, to share with you all um, and kind of promote the role of the pharmacist as I am still a practicing pharmacist um, in addition to my role as the Director of Practice Development at MPA, uh, the Missouri Pharmacy Association. So just kind of a little bit more on my background and what we'll cover today. 
Um, I'm also, like I said, a practicing pharmacist at a family owned community pharmacy in rural central Missouri. Uh, and then I did start a consulting business, enhanced care consulting, specifically um, looking at and focusing on utilizing pharmacists and pharmacy teams in public health initiatives um, and increasing access to care for patients. Uh, so today we'll just cover um, some basic uh, and innovative things that involve pharmacists. So the Surgeon General's call to action to control hypertension, uh, team-based care approach and the pharmacist impact, and then challenges and opportunities for involving pharmacists on your healthcare team. Um, and for any pharmacists on uh, today, I will be preaching to the choir a little bit for you guys, um, but hopefully I do, I do a good job promoting why pharmacists should be included um, and the impact that we can have. All right, so diving in, less about me. Um, the US does spend as much money correcting the problems caused by medications as we do on the drugs themselves. And when I read this statement, um, it really stood out to me um, as just kind of looking at how much we spend on drugs. We all know it's crazy, but then looking at the problems related to those medications as well. So the Congressional Budget Office actually estimates that spending on Medicare Part D as in, as in drug uh, benefits will total $96 billion in 2021. So this year alone, just on the medications, not the medication related problems, but we'll be spending $96 billion. And that's just with Medicare. So that doesn't involve Medicaid and commercial insurance plans as well. All right, but in my opinion, uh, money isn't really the biggest problem. Uh, we have some real problems affecting patients and patient health in our communities that are bigger than money. Um, so patient involvement and access to care. This is also incredibly important when you're looking at the role of the pharmacist, specifically in community pharmacy, um, because 90% of Americans live within only five miles of a community pharmacy. So when you're talking about increasing access to care, I think top of mind should be that statistic that nine out of 10 Americans are within those five miles. Um, and so looking at as well, in that increased access to care, you have provider time and reimbursement being an issue as far as your, your reimbursement is shrinking and your time is as well. There aren't enough hours in the day to sit and speak with every patient and educate and counsel on everything that you could possibly think of to keep that patient healthier. Um, so I want pharmacists to really be seen as um, an extender of those, those healthcare um, interactions. Um, and then education is not just for the patient. Um, so education is also an issue in just understanding when we talk about team-based care, what each member of the team can bring to the table. Uh, so recently I, I helped with a um, professional education center at the College of Pharmacy in St. Louis and we involved several different specialties as far as nursing students, MD, or um, medical students, OT, PT, uh, PA students, and pharmacy students as well. And they, we brought them all together. And when I mention um, certain elements or roles that the pharmacist can play, it's always interesting to me that other healthcare professionals don't learn um, about the teammates and team members on their team. Uh, and so what we can bring to the table, not just as pharmacists, but also understanding what all of the elements and uh, professionals bring to that team. And then navigating the system. So here's where um, I think a real uh, large problem exists is that our healthcare system is so complex that sometimes uh, pharmacists and other healthcare professionals even need help navigating it. So how do we expect a patient who's not a healthcare professional to navigate that system? Um, so just a patient understanding what's covered, whether a deductible or a copay or a premium and what's the difference, what's next for their care and what options are there for their care. Um, so these are all areas that pharmacists can play a role in, um, but they're also issues that have kind of a bigger um, need as far as needing to be addressed as a team-based care approach. So now diving into the Surgeon General's call to action to control hypertension. Um, this was especially near and dear to my heart since it does call to action to utilize team-based care approaches, including pharmacists. 
Um, so I'm just going to kind of read my favorite blurb from it, um, that pharmacies should not simply be considered a way to distribute medication. And pharmacists have known this for a long time. Our reimbursement on medications sometimes is less uh, than the patient, um, than we're purchasing the medication for. So in some instances with fees that come out of the back end from the pharmacy benefit managers, the pharmacy is losing money when they dispense medications. Um, and so community-based pharmacists can support hypertension management in meaningful ways, including being integral members of care teams through collaborative practice agreements, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, with local healthcare practices and health systems. They can provide medication therapy management services to reconcile medication regimens, support adherence, and recommend or make adjustments to medications to help patients lower their blood pressure. Um, ultimately, I don't think this is um, necessarily specific to hypertension or blood pressure control. This is just an area where the Surgeon General saw a big impact for pharmacy and pharmacists to be involved. So looking at the comprehensive hypertension treatment protocol mentioned in the Surgeon General's call to action, I kind of questioned where could a pharmacist have an impact? And when I was looking at these elements, I was going to put arrows on each one that a pharmacist could have an impact on, but um, it would have been covering the screen because every element can involve a pharmacist. So when you're looking at educating a patient on uh, accurate BP measurements or optimal targets, um, that is self-monitored blood pressure, which we're already use, utilizing pharmacists for. Um, in looking at the um, cardiovascular disease risk calculation, we learned that in pharmacy school, we're already doing that. Uh, the team-based care approach is what we're here talking about today. And on and on across the wheel of the treatment protocol are all medication and non-farm uh, therapies. So that was another element um, that we have extensive training in is non-pharmacological therapies. So even though I'm a pharmacist, um, I actually personally don't enjoy taking medications. Um, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Most of my patients don't enjoy taking medications as well. So I think that's also, again, where that education component and counseling component come into play. Um, so I know most states have laws on the books that are similar to those in Missouri related to patient counseling. So in Missouri, we're required as pharmacists by law to offer counseling to every patient, whether it's a new or refilled prescription. Um, in other states like Iowa, they're actually required to counsel, not just offer counseling to patients on new and refilled prescriptions. Um, and so this is an integral part of when you go to the pharmacy, hopefully in Missouri, every pharmacist or pharmacy technician who checks you out um, when you're picking up your medications asks, do you have any questions for the pharmacist? Um, and then my, my quote here is that drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. Um, so as a pharmacist, again, counseling just on the basics of why you're taking that medication, because again, we don't enjoy taking medication. It's not something that, you know, I'd want to pick up as a hobby. Even as a pharmacist, I'm not enjoying taking ibuprofen even when I have a headache. So understanding that um, patients are kind of in the same boat and are not excited about taking those medications. And they obviously can't work and help control blood pressure or diabetes, et cetera, if they don't take them and take them as prescribed. So did you know, um, I'm just kind of gonna go through some basic facts about pharmacists um, to date. Um, mainly because these are sometimes not well understood. So the education that a pharmacist gets now um, is a doctorate of pharmacy. So it's six to seven years um, to uh, become a pharmacist and get that doctorate of pharmacy with extensive training in medication therapy, um, even diagnosing to understand the appropriate medication that goes along with that disease and chronic disease state. Um, and then again, non-pharmacological therapy, extensive knowledge of patient counseling and education. So we're specifically trained in how to talk to a lay person who doesn't maybe have a high, high health literacy uh, value to educate them on how to take medications and, and kind of navigate that healthcare system that is so complex that I mentioned previously. 
Um, another important aspect of pharmacy is that we're in all healthcare settings and not just healthcare settings. So we're in the community, we're in the health systems as far as inpatient and outpatient. Uh, so there are several pharmacies on teams or pharmacists on teams that are not based in the pharmacy. They never actually pick up a prescription bottle unless it's counseling a medication uh, to uh, counseling on a medication to a patient. There are pharmacists involved in ambulatory care clinics and primary care offices. There's long-term care pharmacists. And then of course, industry and research um, is a big component, especially when you're talking about medications. Um, and then I mentioned previously that there are collaborative practice agreements, but I think something that's somewhat overlooked is clinical service agreements. Um, so kind of looking at what is the difference between a collaborative practice agreement and the clinical service agreement. Uh, so pharmacists right now um, federally do not have what's known as provider status. So we're not able to bill Medicare Part B as in boy or any medical claims um, outside of the dispensing workflow for services that we may provide or interventions for patients. Um, however, under a collaborative practice agreement, pharmacists can modify therapy, um, have some additional um, services that they can provide as an extender of that primary care or healthcare professional. Um, and then with that, it, again, that's if you're going to look at therapies and modify, um, potentially discontinue, change, et cetera, based on what's in that protocol or practice agreement. Then there's a clinical service agreement. And these are a little less extensive because pharmacists are strictly just monitoring the therapy and making recommendations versus modifying any therapy changes. Um, so looking at medication optimization and what is best for which patients, um, collaborative practice agreements are kind of the way to go if you're wanting a pharmacist to have an impact on that medication uh, therapy. Um, but clinical service agreements can allow pharmacists to still bill for services and be an extender without having to change anything in the patient's therapy without recommending and discussing it with um, their prescriber. Um, so I also recommend looking into clinical service agreements with a pharmacist if you're wanting to add them to your healthcare team and aren't quite ready to go that protocol or practice agreement route. Um, and pharmacists did come together several years ago and created the pharmacist patient centered care process. Um, it was again, somewhat of a misunderstanding that pharmacists are only involved in dispensing medications. Um, really when a pharmacist even is involved in the dispensing workflow at a pharmacy, they're not the ones counting the pills and putting them in the bottles. Uh, they are actually looking at, you know, is it right dose, right uh, time, right route, right patient, et cetera, and making sure there are no drug interactions, no allergy interactions, no disease drug interactions, et cetera. Um, and all of this within kind of a two to five minute span without needing additional follow-up. So if it is indeed the right and appropriate medication for that patient, um, they kind of go through this list in their head um, of everything that is involved in making sure that that's the case. Um, so here is the patient-centered care approach, and this is where we really want to be involved in the services, counseling, and education of our patients. Um, and this is kind of what we follow as pharmacists. It's taught in school and beyond um, and continuously comes up, but there's some things that I do wanna point out, and that's the collaborate and communicate in that center. Um, so collaboration and communication are key, especially when you look at a pharmacist in relation to the team-based care um, approach. So as a pharmacy, especially a community pharmacy, we are a hub for patient health information. So when I say a hub for patient health information, I mean that everyone feeds into the pharmacy. As long as the patient is utilizing one pharmacy, which is highly recommended uh, because of this element, all of the prescriptions that are coming in, whether they're from the emergency room, urgent care, uh, their primary care pre prescriber, um, and any specialist they may see, such as an endocrinologist or cardiologist, are coming into the pharmacy. Um, now, whether those have ne necessarily lab values associated with them or diagnosis codes um, that would be preferred but aren't always included in that script. However, uh, sometimes and often actually pharmacists will find potential drug interactions or a reason that a patient shouldn't be on a certain medication um, 
or potential for not needing that medication for, for whatever reason. And because they are that hub of health information, they can see that, you know, the same medication was prescribed by the cardiologist as the primary care provider. And having a note to say, you know, the patient's not gonna know that they're taking lisinopril versus lisinopril with hydrochlorothiazide and that those are two similar medications, uh, just kind of overlapping or duplicative therapy. Um, they're going to see it as, you know, this one affects this and this one affects something else um, versus both having an effect um, that wasn't necessarily intended. And then we also have multiple touch points with our patients per year. So I'll jump into that on the next slide, which really hits home for that one. Um, and then again, just tying in that collaboration with other healthcare professionals. Because we see ourselves as the hub of patient health information and that final stop of safety and efficacy um, and education before the patient goes home and is then sent off to take care of their own health um, and medication use, that is really, really important to pharmacy is that collaboration and communication. Um, so looking at the team-based care approach put into perspective. Uh, so when I mentioned that you see your, you have multiple patient touch points with the pharmacist, um, I, I meant that as almost 10 times more than you might have with your primary care provider. So complex patients, those that utilize the most of our healthcare dollars and have the multiple comorbidities um, on several medications um, with chronic disease comorbidities as well see their community pharmacist on average 35 times per year. And these same complex patients see their primary care provider an average of two to four times per year. So again, that's almost a 10 times uh, difference uh, in how often you see your pharmacist versus your primary care provider. Um, and this is where, again, pharmacists can be primary care provider extenders. Um, so I uh, recently uh, graduated with my MBA and one of the um, classes, entrepreneurship, um, required or requested that we write a paper on a new idea. And honestly, when I was thinking of this new idea, I was really surprised that it's not already in practice. Um, so my idea was, you know, we have primary care providers and because pharmacists don't have provider status, we can't bill for, for that kind of service. But why is there not a primary care pharmacist? Um, especially when you look at this statistic of seeing them 10 times more a year, um, or sorry, 25 to 30 times more per year, 10 times more than your primary care provider, um, there really should be a PCP and a PC farm on every patient's team. Um, and then this is where I also want to dive into the Community Preventative Services Task Force recommendations that have recently, um, in the last several years, really involved patient care, uh, team-based approaches, um, and involving pharmacists. So there's two specific ones that I wanted to point out. Uh, one is on cardiovascular disease specifically, and it's pharmacy-based medication adherence interventions. Um, and with that, the summary of the recommendation was that uh, tailored pharmacy-based adherence interventions for cardiovascular disease prevention are recommended. Uh, the CPSTF also finds these interventions are cost-effective for cardiovascular disease prevention. Um, so it mentions those tailored pharmacy-based interventions, uh, which aim to help patients who are at risk take their medications as prescribed. So we mentioned before, drugs don't work in people who don't take them. Uh, but there's also opportunities here when you mention tailored pharmacy-based interventions. And I'll talk about that in some of the opportunities as well as barriers to pharmacist services. Um, the second CPSTF recommendation is that team-based care um, should be utilized to control type 2 diabetes as well. Uh, so team-based care for diabetes management, which I thought was related uh, to the hypertension control and blood pressure just because those two um, chronic diseases go hand in hand. Um, but one of the major findings of this recommendation was that adding either a nurse or pharmacist led to improved diabetes-related outcomes. Um, and pharmacists um, are generally less thought of as far as adding to the team-based care than nurses, but it also found that teams with a pharmacist 
produced greater reductions in patients' blood glucose levels. And my mom's a nurse, so nothing against nurses. I think you all are heroes and saints. Uh, but when you add a pharmacist to the team, we can have an impact is all that I'm wanting to kind of hit home with that is improving diabetes related outcomes, as well as blood pressure related outcomes, or you can add a pharmacist to behavioral health teams, asthma, COPD, et cetera. Um, so here I'm going to dive into the opportunities for involving a pharmacist on the team. And there's a lot of words on the screen, so I'm kind of going to go through each one just to explain what um, the opportunity is and why it should be included. So I, I lumped together chronic care management, remote physiological monitoring, and transitions of care management, mainly because these are all opportunities for that clinical service agreement with a uh, provider and a pharmacist um, to be able to bill for additional services under Medicare Part B as in boy. So under the medical billing separate from the pharmacy drug benefits, um, pharmacists can bill for services um, outside of dispensing. So all of these do not require any changes in therapy. So if a patient's on a blood pressure medication and they're getting chronic care management for their hypertension control, um, nothing needs to change in their therapy or the pharmacist doesn't need to have access or a collaborative practice agreement to be able to make those changes. They just need to be working with a clinical service agreement with a provider who has an NPI that's able to bill Medicare Part B. Um, and then remote physiological monitoring is very similar um, in transitions of care management as well in that the pharmacist can't bill for it themselves. So they need to have an agreement um, to perform clinical services with another provider under their NPI for billing purposes mainly. Um, and so with remote physiological monitoring, we actually um, have taken that as our next step from self-monitored blood pressure. So after we teach and educate the patients on self-monitored blood pressure and all of the elements that go with that, we're actually looking at programs and projects involving pharmacists specifically in remote physiological monitoring and blood pressure. So this would be where a patient receives a blood pressure monitor that re sends real-time data to a platform that the pharmacist and uh, the, the primary care physician would have access to. Uh, and the pharmacist is mainly looking at that for any um, changes in blood pressure, high or low, um, and then following up with the patient to see if it's something that needs to be referred to the physician. Um, and this is really interesting when you're looking at continuous monitoring um, and looking at educating patients as needed throughout the, the time span of in between their primary care visits. Um, so this is, again, where the pharmacist really can have an impact when you're seeing them so many more times, even in person, but this can be um, telephonically as well. And then transitions of care management. Uh, I feel like transitions of care has been a hot topic that still is kind of not been addressed, um, but the, it's an opportunity for pharmacists to be involved. And when you look at all of the healthcare settings that involve pharmacists from the ER to the health system, the um, inpatient versus outpatient, and then the community pharmacist as well, um, or the long-term care or rehab facility, um, that's where pharmacists really can have an impact because you can not only have collaboration and communication between various healthcare professionals, but we've looked at projects and programs involving clinic-based pharmacy and pharmacists um, looking and connecting with uh, community-based pharmacists as well. Um, so sometimes it's been difficult to connect a community pharmacy with a health system, for example, just because of the IT and technology barriers associated with sharing EHR. Um, so instead, we've kind of gone the route of, well, pharmacists already know what pharmacists are doing in both settings, uh, so we'll connect there and have a bigger impact um, and better communication potentially just because we aren't necessarily having access to that EHR. Um, so that's where the clinic-based and community-based pharmacy program kind of grew out of this transitions of care management um, approach. And then with diabetes education, uh, self-monitored blood pressure and smoking cessation counseling. I consider all of these kind of in that bucket of education and counseling that pharmacists are um, really well-trained in bringing down to the patient level um, and then bringing it back up and having that communication and collaboration with the provider. So with diabetes education, this is an opportunity for pharmacies to become accredited through ADCES or ADA. 
um, to provide these education classes for patients. Um, again, we've looked at self-monitored blood pressure education and taken that to the next level with remote physiological monitoring. Um, and then something unique uh, to Missouri actually is that, or not unique to Missouri, but uh, that just passed in Missouri, uh, is that we can prescribe NRT therapy for, um, or nicotine replacement therapy for patients um, outside of Chantix and Zyban um, for patients who, especially for patients, for example, on Medicaid, where over-the-counters would be covered if they had a prescription. Um, and so we can write that prescription now for them to get it covered so that they're not having to pay out of pocket for somewhat expensive medications, um, even though they're over-the-counter. And then we can provide that smoking cessation counseling. So kind of going along with um, receiving an over-the-counter smoking cessation product um, or medication, it really requires a village to quit smoking. So it also needs that counseling, holding the patient accountable, following up and monitoring them um, and their therapy. And then medication optimization and comprehensive medication reviews. This is where, in my opinion, pharmacists really have an impact and can shine. Um, unfortunately, they kind of uh, lumped comprehensive medication reviews under Medicare Part D as in dog. And recently, um, those are not recently, sorry, with those platforms that enable pharmacists to bill for medication therapy management, including the comprehensive medication reviews, um, they're actually very retroactive. So versus uh, when a patient is non-adherent to a medication for so many months based on their fill history, um, so, you know, not picking up every 30 days for a 30 day medication, they may pick up at day 40 or 45 consistently for three to six months, then they pop in for needing a comprehensive medication review or medication therapy management intervention. To me, that's a little too late. Uh, I think it should be a proactive approach to, you know, a provider saying this patient is now on four or five medications, let's have them sit down with a pharmacist for a CMR. Um, and be able to address any issues the patient may have with those medications in understanding how to take them, not being willing to take them because they don't understand how it works or why they're taking it, understanding potential side effects so they don't stop it early, um, and then when to what else to look out for and when to call their doctor as well. Um, so to me, the proactive approach would be uh, or would have a much bigger impact on saving healthcare dollars, improving patient outcomes and health benefits. Um, but unfortunately, where MTM has gone is under that retroactive approach. Now, I think recently, um, a lot of providers and prescribers are looking at pharmacists to do these reviews um, for them outside of strictly pharmacists looking for them. Uh, but that's kind of where I'd like to see a pharmacist impact um, and utilizing that team-based care approach is really thinking of the pharmacist first. So if it's a medication related issue or they're on multiple medications, et cetera, um, thinking of the pharmacist and how, you know, how do I send them? How do I refer? Just like a pharmacist would refer to a physician in certain instances um, or refer a patient to the ER, et cetera. Um, I'd like other healthcare professionals to think of the pharmacist as a referral network as well. Um, and then adherence counseling, packaging, and interventions. Um, so obviously patients um, or pharmacists are already doing a lot of adherence counseling, um, but I'm, I wasn't aware of all of the opportunities and options for specific packaging and special interventions for patients who need additional adherence support. Um, so that packaging could include not only the bubble card, the bubble cards that have like multiple medications per dose. Um, there's actually strips. Um, we, we call them uh, medication strips that have each dose um, per day in a package. So for example, if you were going out of town, you don't need to take your 25 bubble cards or your one giant one with your medications in it. Um, you can actually just rip off the seven day doses and then take that with you and still have the rest there. It also helps for caregivers um, to know if a patient took their dose that morning. They can see it because it's written right on the, the strip there. Um, so those are really unique packaging options for pharmacists and pharmacies to have an impact on adherence and adherence counseling. 
And I think along with those is if a patient is utilizing any specific adherence packaging, referring them to that pharmacist for additional education and counseling. Um, I think it's, it's um, an obvious thing to healthcare professionals maybe to use a pharmacist on their team or to uh, uh, request or um, assume that the pharmacist is counseling. It's not always as obvious to the public or patients. Um, so now patients who I mentioned previously, those complex comorbidity, chronic disease patients who are on a lot of medications, who attend and go to the pharmacy 35 times a year, are more likely to ask their pharmacist for questions and know that the pharmacist can provide a lot of additional education and counseling for them. Uh, but your, um, your kind of uh, typical less complex patient who may only go to the pharmacy, you know, 10 to 12 times a year um, for just that one, you know, monthly medication may not realize that their questions could be answered immediately and very accessibly by a pharmacist. Um, and so if a physician or another healthcare professional refers that patient to ask their pharmacist, um, that really helps uh, with navigating the healthcare team and promoting that team-based care approach. So I'm really big on developing referral networks, um, whether it's utilizing community health workers to connect pharmacists, pharmacy teams, um, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, anyone who's involved in that patient's care um, really should be a part of a referral network and have kind of the go-to people that they call or know who does what on that team. I think it helps patients also navigate that healthcare uh, system that's really complex in our, in our society and in our uh, country. Um, and so letting a patient know exactly what to do and what to expect um, as far as you know, next steps or what are their options for education and counseling, et, et cetera, um, and services is really, really helpful in navigating that. Um, so kind of to go along with that, um, that referral network and helping the patient navigate, um, even coming into a pharmacy for the first time, I train technicians to let patients know that, you know, your medication won't be ready right away. It may take 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so to have a seat or else the patient ends up standing there and watching you the whole time and expecting it to be ready right away. And that's mainly because it's not common sense. The healthcare system is not common sense. Um, and patients don't understand how to navigate it, even when going into a pharmacy, where as a pharmacist, it's just second nature to me. You, you drop your prescription off, you sit down and you go pick it up after. Um, but it's not as common sense to somebody who's first time in a pharmacy. Um, it's their first time. All right, so jumping into barriers to pharmacy services. Um, these all have coins and money in the pictures because that's the biggest barrier, unfortunately. I mentioned that money isn't the biggest problem uh, to our healthcare system, but it is a huge barrier to pharmacy services. Um, so when you're looking at barriers, especially with billing and reimbursement, because we don't have provider status under the federal uh, Medicare and CMS do not see us as providers, um, we can't bill for services without a collaborative practice agreement or a uh, clinical service agreement. So utilizing a provider's NPI. Uh, to me, I utilize the quotes over provider because if you're providing services, to me, that makes you a provider. Uh, but just because the federal government doesn't see us that way, um, we're not able to bill. Uh, and so billing and reimbursement for pharmacy services, while we know that these services, um, according to CPSTF and the uh, Surgeon General's call to action, we know that these services have an impact and save healthcare dollars, but we're not willing to spend them um, to prevent and promote uh, utilizing a pharmacist on the team. And then I included contracting and credentialing here because our healthcare system separates out pharmacy benefits from medical benefits and services. It makes it really difficult for pharmacists who are able to provide services specifically based in their state scope of practice to get anywhere with commercial Medicaid and Medicare contracting. Um, so getting even your foot in the door to be able to bill for that service if you're allowed to in your state. For example, Medicare allows pharmacies to um, bill for diabetes education as a site um, because the site get, can get accredited. However, pharmacies go through months worth of hoops and jumping through these hoops um, to just get a single contract 
uh, to be able to bill for these services if they get a contract at all, especially with commercial plans, um, because they get they get the runaround. So what happens is a pharmacist will call the medical benefits for that patient, want to get contracted to provide diabetes education with a referral from the physician um, or primary care provider, and then they will get sent to the pharmacy benefits as their their next um, their next call. So. It kind of goes in this, this circle of wanting to connect for medical benefits and getting sent to the pharmacy benefits. Pharmacy benefits say you can't send a diabetes education claim to us, you need to go to medical benefits. Um, and so just the lack of understanding and awareness of what pharmacists can bill for um, in that healthcare insurance space. Uh, so that's another barrier as well. And then uh, my last slide is about how to make an impact. Um, so. First and foremost is a pharmacist on your healthcare team. And if not, let's start there. Or if it is, um, if you can't add a pharmacist to your healthcare team for whatever reason, I want you to think pharmacy. Uh, so if it's a medication related problem or an education or counseling related problem, or you just need more time and extension of your services as a provider, I want you to think pharmacy. Um, if you need more patient care time, again, add a pharmacist, whether that's just referring the patient to their community pharmacist. Um, it doesn't have to be within your clinic or within your building. Um, there's community pharmacists within five miles of 90% of Americans. So you can refer their patient, your patient to that pharmacist. And the last thing is that we need advocates. Uh, so pharmacy can shout um, from the top of the buildings and, and from the roof, um, to promote pharmacists on the healthcare team and utilize us, we're ready and accessible. Um, we are the most underutilized accessible healthcare professionals in my opinion, um, but we need healthcare leadership champions. Um, so whether that's to add a pharmacist on the team or to advocate to um, professionals and legislators as well. Um, so non-healthcare related uh, advocacy as well. And I don't mean necessarily politically, I, um, Although I do uh, have somewhat of a political advocacy role at the Pharmacy Association, it's more so about patient care, uh, just to increase access and quality for patients. Um, but again, pharmacists saying that you need to add pharmacists to this uh, service or billing code or whatever it may be, um, isn't as valuable as a healthcare team coming together and saying, this is what we need for our patients um, and the best interest of our patients. Um, so again, if I can reiterate anything, um, I want you to think of pharmacy, have kind of this bi-directional referral process, um, allow pharmacy to have access to your EHR um, and have clinical, start in having clinical service agreements or collaborative practice agreements. Um, I mentioned the EHR, I'm gonna jump on that just for, for a quick second. Um, pharmacy software and uh, health system or health clinic EHRs are a little bit different. They don't necessarily interact very well. Uh, pharmacists are actively trying to change that with um, e-care planning um, or electronic care plans that they can send through their pharmacy software to an EHR that can be uploaded. Uh, but I think the best um, avenue for, again, having that hub of patient health information is allowing access to an EHR. It could be limited access. It can be even as simple if they can't have access to your EHR because they have to jump through the red tape of bureaucracy, um, having, sharing those lab values for a pharmacist, um, for your patients. So if it's on their hypertension, um, sending the lab values of what were their last couple blood pressure readings, um, or even if you have a question related to a medication as a healthcare professional, think pharmacy, uh, call your community pharmacist. They're just as accessible to healthcare professionals as they are to patients. Um, because as pharmacists, we love sharing our knowledge. We, we went to school for a long time too. So we are happy and willing to share it. Um, and I always tell patients if they're not, then find a new pharmacy. <laughs> Uh, cause they may just, you know, um, need a, a fresh, fresh pharmacist, uh, ready to go and ready to educate. Um, so with that, um, I will take any questions and open up to the chat. Um, and let's see, I don't know if I should stop sharing my screen, but I'll leave it on here just in case anyone wants to connect and collaborate as well, or ask any additional questions. I'm always happy to chat. Um, you can reach me at Annie at enhancedcareconsulting.com. 
Um, and I can um, also, I what, before I forget, I wanted to mention that I'm happy to work with state health departments as well. If you're interested in utilizing pharmacists or pharmacy teams in your programs, uh, Missouri is amazing. Um, and, you know, woohoo to Missouri for utilizing pharmacists. And I feel that our Department of Health and Senior Services, shout out to Chris Kummerfeld and everyone there, um, thinking pharmacy in having an impact on patient care and patient access. Um, so I'm happy to talk to any states that also want to involve pharmacy as well. Thank you so much, Annie. This was, was fantastic. Um, and while we're waiting for some uh, questions to come in, we did have, um, we did want have one come through the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom. And the question is, how difficult is it to get reimbursed for DSMES services through Medicaid? That is a great question. Um, so it depends on the state. Uh, some state Medicaid programs um, do not pay for DSME services, um, and that's mainly because um, the Medicaid pharmacy benefits are outsourced um, to a um, uh, managed care organization. So when pharmacy is allowed to pay, uh, be based under the Medicaid, like carved out of that managed care organization and just bill fee for service to Medicaid, it's a little bit easier to advocate for payment for DSME services. Um, so in Missouri, we just recently um, added DSME to our state Medicaid program. We're still kind of working through some of the kinks, um, especially because one of our pharmacies who offers that service, for example, in their community uh, tested, um, about 50 patients on you know, test claims calling Medicaid and asking if this patient was eligible and none of the patients were eligible uh, for DSME services. So we're just working really closely with our director of pharmacy here, um, advocating to him on any of the issues. And we're again, lucky in Missouri that our director of pharmacy um, for Missouri Medicaid is very innovative and open um, to pushing the profession forward and doing anything he can to implement and impact patient care um, in Missouri. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple, um, uh, another question that has come in. So thank you everyone who's submitting questions. You can use the chat um, or the Q&A section or raise your hand to request to ask your question live. Um, here's one. I work at the local health department. We are tasked with trying to help pharma pharmacy and P PCPs work together like you're discussing. Do you think it's better to start by reaching out to the uh, pharmacy side or the PCP side? Um, I personally would start with both. <laughs> so I think it's actually really important to bring both sides together in that conversation, whether starting with the associations that oversee them. So in Missouri, that would be the Missouri Pharmacy Association and the Missouri Primary Care Association. Um, sometimes in other states, they may have different um, acronyms or names for those associations, but looking at their um, organization that helps advocate for that profession um, and bringing those leaders to the table. Um, there's also um, a network of pharmacies um, across the nation. So there's specific networks in each state um, and some states have multiple networks, but there's also a, a a nationwide network. It's called the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network or CPSN. Uh, and these are community pharmacies that are providing enhanced services or interested in adding enhanced services um, to their pharmacy. So if you're interested in learning more about CPSN as well, I can connect you with your state CPSN leadership. Um, I think that's a really, uh, not easy, but uh, low hanging fruit way to go because those pharmacists and pharmacies are already reaching out, have relationships with their PCPs, are providing these services as well. Um, and so reaching out to them in addition to the pharmacy association and primary care association and bringing those leaders to the table. Um, I don't think it's necessarily starting with one in each silo. I really think it's bringing everyone um, into a conversation. Um, so we've had conversations just um, with, within our organization um, and primary care association and just how we can collaborate better. Um, and that goes a lot 
further, I think, in that conversation in just that hour that we might talk or 30 minutes, because now we understand the pain points of both um, both professions and both associations even in reaching their professions. Um, and so we can address those pain points before it comes up, before we even implement a program. Great, thank you. I see in the chat Q&A um, that it sounds like it's a case-by-case -case basis for DSME programs. Um, it, it's not necessarily case-by-case. -case. I think it's actually more of a, um, of an advocacy route. So um, I think in state Medicaid uh, programs paying for DSME, first we need to make sure that they do. And if they don't, we need to advocate for that, whether it's the pharmacist or the health department or both, uh, the more champions, the better for promoting um, payment for services like DSME. Um, but then also not necessarily case by case as far as patients, but also advocating for all eligible patients to be included. Um, so I don't, yes, it, right now it's a case by case basis probably, but I think it's also an advocacy route or opportunity. Great. Um, it looks like um, Liz, we had someone raise their hand. Would you be able to unmute that person? No. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I am uh, a pharmacist as well, uh, Dr. Mohamed Jallo. I'm from North Carolina. But my question is, uh, we just started the RPM program, Remote Patient Monitoring Program. And uh, uh, my biggest problem is getting referrals from physicians. How would you go about trying to build that uh, confidence in those providers being able to send you patients so that you can get them into the, patient, into the patient, Remote Patient Monitoring? That is a great question. Um, so from the pharmacy side, I think first having a conversation with other healthcare professionals, including physicians, not just saying, you know, we have this service and we can provide this service, uh, but finding out what you can do for them first before they do something for you. Uh, so for example, um, just figuring out what are their pain points for their patients with diabetes. It may not be um, that they think they need a remote patient monitoring program, but when you look at those pain points and addressing um, maybe it's just getting patients to come for their appointments or taking their medications as prescribed or um, utilizing their blood glucose monitor as often as they should um, or understanding how to utilize it or the education associated with it. Um, whatever those pain points might be for their patients with diabetes, um, first addressing that and then showing how remote patient monitoring can um, have an impact. I think it's also really important to note that health system based uh, physicians are harder to get referrals from, unfortunately, um, than you know, private or independent physician groups or clinics. Um, I think it kind of is the same boat for pharmacists as well. You know, chain-based pharmacists may be a little bit harder to get a hold of than an independent, um, not in all instances, but just um, we've experienced that in Missouri that some health systems um, limit the referrals that their physicians can, can um, send. So they have to be internal, which isn't really the best interest of the patient or helping access for the patient. Um, but I think sometimes it requires going up the ladder. Um, so having those conversations first with maybe the pharmacy team at that health system, and then who are their diabetes specialists or endocrinologists that you can connect with. And then if their pain point is really that they're not allowed to refer outside of the health system, just keep going up that ladder. So who is it that is ultimately making that decision? Because likely they don't know what a pharmacist can do or the impact that a pharmacist can have. Um, so as a fellow pharmacist, I think um, we're in the, we're in that stage of just educating everyone on what we can do as well, unfortunately. <laughs> so you're kind of battling two battles at the same time. 
Great, thank you. And we've um, got John Clymer with us who put a great comment in the chat, but as, is live now and can expand on it. Go ahead, John. Sure, thanks, Rochelle. And Annie, congratulations on the great presentation. Uh, it's really well done and you packed a ton of useful information into it. Uh, I'm executive director of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention and also a member of the Community Preventive Services Task Force. So I'm really pleased to hear you refer to the community guide recommendations, uh, which strongly support uh, the inclusion of pharmacists in team-based care, because after doing rigorous systematic reviews of evidence, it is crystal clear that including pharmacists significantly improves hypertension control it significantly improves cholesterol control. It significantly improves diabetes control. And most importantly, it improves patient outcomes, patient health. And then as you pointed out, Annie, we also know from economic reviews that it's cost effective. So now it's really important for all of us to advocate, as you said, as you suggested, with health systems, for pharmacists to be included as part of the team. And I know that they're um, in some systems, they will look at financial pressures um, against including pharmacists. And it's certainly to the patient's benefit and to the benefit of those who are uh, primarily concerned about the quality of the care that they provide to include the pharmacists. So we need to be advocating and helping the decision makers understand that. And then we also ought to be looking at Jefferson City and advocating there for inclusion of pharmacists as providers so that uh, pharmacists can provide the kind of care, make it more readily available to people uh, that we know will help to improve their health. And to be honest, I, I think you're too diplomatic to, to say this. That's not a criticism. Um, yeah. so, so I will, um, the resistance from this is the medical lobby. Uh, they don't want competitors and they unfortunately view pharmacists not as collaborators who you are, but unfortunately they, um, in a very narrow view, look at any other providers as competitors. And that's led them to oppose um, provider status for nurses, for PAs, for NPs, and now pharmacists. And that's to the detriment of the public and patients. And we need to solve that. I just wanna reiterate what you said about being an advocate. Um, so if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and that goes for healthcare in general, not just pharmacy. Um, so it's, yeah, everyone needs to be an advocate. Even if you say you don't like politics, um, the people making the decisions on what we can and can't do in the healthcare system are the politicians. Absolutely. Right, right. and thank you. Um, Annie will, um, at this time, thank you for your participation today for a fantastic um, content and you know, thought-provoking discussion. There are additional, a uh, couple additional questions in the Q&A box. If you have a chance to um, respond to those, great. If not, we can certainly get those back out to the group. But in the interest of time, I would like to go ahead and get to our conclusion. Um, quickly, just want to um, a, a point out the American Heart Association's program um, in conjunction with the American Medical Association Target Blood Pressure or Target BP. Um, this is an initiative aimed at in, uh, improving health outcomes by evidence, um, evidence approaches to hypertension control. And um, Liz, if you want to just go ahead and switch to the slides, yes, our, our framework is based on MAP, which um, listed here is around measuring accurately with every patient every time, acting rapidly, partnering with patients. And I think today our presentation highlighted that, uh, that sector of the MAP framework, so really does bring it full circle. Um, target blood pressure has some great resources, some online resources 
um, for health care practices who are diagnosing and treating hypertension, anything from webinars and CME credits to tools for patients and providers, as well as quick assessment tool on where, as a practice, you could start with um, looking at some evidence-based practices to improve hypertension control. For recognition this year, the data submission deadline is May 28th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so just a few short days away. So we encourage healthcare organizations who are, one, are participating in target blood pressure to be mindful of that deadline. I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank um, our our co present our co collaborators today in making this um, innovation in hypertension control series possible, and put a plug in for two additional workshops that are coming up. Uh, the first workshop, or the next workshop, is next week at noon, and then following on June 9th at noon. More information can be found in your email. So with that, um, I thank you all again for being a part of today's. Uh, webinar and um, wish you well. We'll close today with an important message from the American Heart Association. Thank you again. Getting back to this, to her, to family, to friends, to hugs. For people at higher risk of COVID-19 complications because of diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart conditions, the COVID-19 vaccine is an important choice. Consider it's the first step towards getting back to what you miss so much safely. Getting back to life. Set your heart on it. It's up to you. A message from the American Heart Association.